ADHD, one of the big things psychiatrists look for is referential thinking. So right now what you're getting in this talk with me is referential thinking. I say one thing, it triggers a thought that I then follow and follow and follow. So quite often when people go to get diagnosed, they think it's what they're saying that the psychiatrist or psychologist is listening to. A lot of it's how you're saying it. Hello and welcome to another episode of Bunny Hugs and Mental Health. I am Todd Rennebaum. Well, I just feel like poop. Uh, I've been, I've just got sick and my kids and wife have been sick. It just keeps going around and around and around. We've all been, there's always been someone sick in my house since like September. So I'm going to make this intro pretty short and sweet. In this episode, I am talking with an ADHD coach from New Zealand. His name is Nigel Sutton. I discovered him on uh, TikTok, and he just seems like a really nice, lovable guy. And uh, we had a really great conversation. He's he's very, very, very chatty, and that's great. So uh, I basically just hit record, and away he went. Um, uh, but I also want to talk about next week. I have a wonderful guest as well. Her name is Amy Over, and she is a Columbine High School shooting survivor. She was even on the perpetrator's hit list. Uh, it's a long story. She has a fascinating uh, podcast series called Confronting Columbine, uh, which you can find, I'm guessing, pretty much anywhere. Uh, I binged it. I, I suggest not binging it because it's kind of, you know, dark and heavy at times. And, uh, uh, you know, you, you get suckered into that trauma kind of stuff and it takes a toll out of you a bit, but uh, anyway, it was, it was really good, a good series. Uh, and so, anyway, I talked to her about um, about all that. And the week after that, I'm talking with Dr. Sadir Gad and talking about lithium. He is a very big promoter of lithium, not just for uh, bipolar or um, other uh, mental illnesses, but just for everyday uh, wellness. Uh, of course, different dosage, but. Uh, uh, we talk about lithium. Uh, but anyway, uh, this week, I like I say, I'm talking with Mr. Nigel Sutton and uh, about ADHD. He was actually diagnosed late in life with ADHD, just like myself. And so, yeah, that's the topic today. So without further ado, I give you Nigel. ADHD coach from TikTok said to me, so he's 36 and he goes, so, you know, do you have any friends? Uh, what what are your friends you know do you talk do you, are, do you get support talking to your other friends with ADHD and I just laughed and I went oh if you're undiagnosed by 50 most of them have dropped off due to the lateness the lack of turning up and so on and the only ones you are left with definitely are neurodivergent and they're usually in a meltdown so it's not really <laughs> the last and when we get together the last thing we want to talk about is actually the neurology behind why we feel like we do it's the last thing we actually discuss at that point but I was, the whole idea of friends was interesting because I mean yeah yeah you don't have a lot left by then <laughs> you've done too many things that neurotypical typical people can't deal with yeah yeah I I find uh yeah I mean I, I have a couple friends that are like very long term friends, but not not very many. And so I'm 45, and I was just diagnosed. So I've had it for two weeks now. Wow. On on paper, so I'm learning a lot lately. And uh, so, are you not an ADHD coach? Um, I do, but only occasionally, and very few people. So, um, essentially, I'm not like living an ADHD coach life. Um. I basically will deal with someone that I feel that they feel they've connected and can see. I feel like I have quite a smart ass approach and I'm a loud mouth and heavily opinionated. And I've got five decades of both trauma and knowledge all at once. And it's a melting pot of wisdom and mess. And so you kind of have to want that. I tend to not want to work with younger people, not because I don't like them very much do, but I just feel like there's no one in the late life diagnosed space much either. And I think that lived reality is different, especially when you're getting meds at your age for the first time. And some of what the young people are living is quite distinct. Um, and to, uh, for mostly, I mean, I'm not being funny, but when you coach someone, the first session is just literally them telling you, they just talk and tell you what they, they've got decades. You know, an hour isn't actually very long. You just listen to what they 
Because first up, that's usually what people want to do is tell their story. You want to obviously kind of give them a few techniques and move them as quickly as you can into useful ideas. But first of all, you've got to let people tell the story because for a lot of us, we haven't. We haven't actually ever put it together as a whole story. And it's a life lived backwards. You, you literally look back through your life and you work out the triggers and behaviours and you find some really astounding things about what you've been doing. Um, you know, one of mine is that I have incorrect vocal inflection when I'm stressed. So I can sound too excited about something I don't care about. I can sound really indifferent about something I do care about. Or I can sound fiercely angry about something I don't care about. But decades ago, I decided, obviously at some point, not so consciously, I decided to run with the emotion that people seem to be receiving. Because I didn't actually know how to say, I'm neurodivergent. That came out wrong. That is literally an incorrect vocal inflection. I'm not that excited. I don't want to come to your damn show. Um, I'm not angry about that at all. I, I literally don't care. Um, and so for decades, I've been operating under re reading the room as to how they've received my vocal inflection and then pretending to be that emotion about that issue. So I'm only just starting to unpack what a mess that's made because I've had to be and pretend to be angry about things I don't care about because I don't know, I didn't know how to say to the room. Um, that came out something really angry and highly engaged when apathy is what I was seeking. Um, you know, I get invited by people I'd meet, I don't know, Mark a barista or something, buying coffee off for a week. I sound too enthusiastic about the show they're in. And then I'd get invited and tickets and things like that because I'd sound really enthusiastic because I wanted to seem approving and, and get on with them and be nice about their day making coffee and stuff. But I didn't want to go to their musical at all. <laughs> and so, you know, that's where the autistic brain kicks in a bit. When that literally happened with a barista and, you know, it was like my favorite place on the way to work and so on, I've never been back again. It's now two years later. I pass it every day still. I, I Once he invited me to his show, I was freaked out. Um, <laughs> and I have literally never gone there again. And it has the oh, only man. vegan sausage roll in the neighborhood. Um, but there you go. No more vegan sausage rolls. Uh, <laughs> and he's all like, very relatable. And so this thing, that, I mean, that's a, a, the generous presumption thing where you've got generous presumption common ground, which is often related to autism, but ADHD can have it too, where we just assume that on meeting someone that we're going to like each other. And it's only when they prove they don't like us usually that we stop liking them. But neurotypical people generally come on the other basis. They don't have generous presumption of common ground. They go prove we have common ground and then I'll decide to like you so you know i suppose what we are is we come on thick and fast we come on too much we're intense it's certainly full on you know back in the day when i was in a, a new romantic relationship that generous presumption is very intense um but the same in a new friendship you know i'm going to give you gifts and pay for things and do whatever i can to show you i like you as my new friend i'm gonna kind of overdo it it's maybe even going to be the, the first or an early gift is a bit inappropriately too much because i'm trying to show you i like you um and so yeah it's those things that's, that you and know, that's red um, flags for other people it's like yeah. love bombing and stuff yeah and what you're actually saying is i just think you're super cool and i really <laughs> like you know and so i mean i also i don't really, like many people but i enjoyed you yeah <laughs> I, I met a, a guy recently at a neurodivergence um march thing down at the parliament grounds here in new zealand and we had met online previously in relation to business and he just literally looked at me and goes oh you would find you here and the two of us just got on so well having a riot of laughter i mean he's an outrageous he literally said to me i've had two heart attacks and a stroke in the last year nigel 46 he goes i'm probably autistic and i go you reckon um because <laughs> i mean just everything about him but i said to him he said um I said, you know, it's just such a relief being around you for a while. I said, I've been struggling lately. And just having an hour around you, a guy my age who is neurodivergent has been a salve. It's been just a help. Um, it's to literally just chat. And I mean, he's very business and savvy and we're both quite smart mouse. So it was quite a fluid conversation with much as much not said as said because we could understand what the other would say and we'd jump really fast. I came away, it was like the most therapeutic thing in ages, you know, just running into this guy who's just like as intense as I am. And, you know, now he's actually going to do some uh, work in my, for my job and stuff, and that's just a side effect. But I suppose that's the other thing, making connections. You know, we're out there always making weird asynchronous connections. 
So I had a scenario yesterday where I actually had to say to my boss, well, I don't know if I had to, but I did. I really struggle with our communication because every time I'm with you, I read the fact that I say, well, first of all, do you understand that neurodivergent people read different signs than other people? And often this may relate to masking. And so a year ago, I told you I was neurodivergent. And then in June, six months later, I stood on a stage and talked to an audience of 150 people about it. And then about two weeks later, I crashed and I also launched a TikTok at the same time. And I've been in a bit of an emotional crash for the last six months. So, you know, I said to him, I said, but, um, oh, referential thinking, I've gone off the topic. Uh, I said to him, um, every time I'm with you, I see disdain and dislike on your face for me. I don't think you like me at all. And so it's really hard to relate to you because those are the signs I'm reading every time we're together. And that's why we're now currently in this incredibly intense conversation that is really, really wiping me out, actually. Um, but I, I don't believe that you like or appreciate me. So it doesn't really matter what you say, because I see different things than you. And I see those signs. And it's why we're having such difficulty with each other. Now, I don't know if that was wise. I feel like I went home and had about four hours of RSD after that one hour meeting. It's the worst RSD in months. Last night was absolutely hideous. And that's when I got your email <laughs> reminding me about this. Um, RSD, rejection, re rejection sensitivity dysphoria. So RSD is one of those things, I think it's really key to ADHD. It's technically not a recognized condition, but lots of psychologists and psychiatrists relate it, and it does seem strong in those of us with the ADHD um, for many. And it's where we take deep upset to real or perceived slights. So it's where we, and we can fester on them for hours, we can revisit them years later. They roughly sit in a box in our brain with the same trauma that they created at the time. They're a bit like grief. If we bring them out of the box, they feel about as fresh as when it happened and nothing much processes it. But rejection sensitivity dysphoria is when you go home and you are totally stressed out about something that happened and you replay it and replay it, overanalyze it, make meanings that may or may not be there. Um, and you have real dramas. I mean, some of us rock, cry, um, stim away. There's a number of things we do, but it can go for such a long time. Probably the thing I noticed is if I've got a dose of RSD about something, so this meeting yesterday definitely gave me one, um, I can be upset for many more hours than the event. <laughs> like, you know, the meeting was an hour. I didn't really get off that last night. I'm not off it now. You know, I mean, it was really upsetting. It was a very confronting meeting. And so RSD is something that it's one of the key signs that you you worry about things after the event and you worry even when things went well about it didn't go the way you wanted, didn't go the way you'd pre-scripted in your brain. I mean, that's the other thing to learn is that neurotypicals don't pre-script stuff. I've, that was astounding to me. That's why they makes no sense. They don't even think about what they're going to say before they say it. Now, I know lots of us ADHDers don't too when we're on a flow, but um, yeah, you're into Man, you're validating so much stuff for me right now. I'm, I'm actually getting emotional. <laughs> like, uh, I, 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 It's like, welcome to the tribe, Todd. It's, the funny thing is, you've got to forgive yourself. And one of the things I heard early on that I really live with is, don't go back through your life trying to apologize for who you've been to various people. It goes really badly anyway. I tried a couple of times. Um, move forward. Keep moving. Move forward. You may have done things that you are not proud of. You may have been characters. I don't know. Those of you who deal in the realm of ADHD rage, and I have a, a dear friend, Mary, who's been a friend of mine for years, and we've even turned ADHD rage on each other, um, and she's had ADHD all her life. Only Mary and I do ADHD rage in a way that I have ever seen. It's so ferocious and scary. And so it's that, you know, it's you, you, I, you learn to unpack lots of things. I'm going to make a completely different point now because I've lost that one. ADHD, one of the big things psychiatrists look for is referential thinking. So right now what you're getting in this talk with me is referential thinking. I say one thing, it triggers a thought that I then follow and follow and follow. So quite often when people go to get diagnosed, they think it's what they're saying that the psychiatrist or psychologist is listening to. A lot of it's how you're saying it. If you, lots of people apparently since TikTok go in and they go, oh, I drink coffee and it really makes me wired. So I've got ADHD. And it's like, oh, I mean, they say it doesn't make me wired. You know, it relaxes me. So I've got ADHD. 
that's not a proven scientific thing at all. That's a TikTok thing. Um, the truth is, for most of us, you drink too much coffee, it puts you on edge. My psychiatrist is always trying to tell me to drink less coffee. It's one of his big things with me. He goes, oh, anxiety, Nigel, it's uh, the coffee. Um, and so what you're hearing right now is referential thinking. I'm saying one thing, it's far in a thought, I go elsewhere. So for the neurotypical brain, this can be quite tangential and difficult to follow. Mostly I find for the neurodiverse brain, it's easier for them to follow because it's somehow the jumping around keeps it together enough to be interesting, hopefully. So yeah, I mean, referential thinking is a really big one that I haven't heard talked about much, but you'll notice often yourself, especially if you're under pressure or you're in stress, the referential thinking will kick in bigger and you often will lose the essence of what you thought you were trying to say. What I'm learning is to go with the referential thinking, stop trying to have my pre-script, some of the better things I've done, and most of the TikToks were cut currently that I've got up were cut from one talk. That was a total referential thinking talk where I, I look down loads in the TikToks. You'll think I'm seeing my notes. I can't see anything. I'm, I'm in a kind of hyperadrenalized state by then. And so I'm looking down for whatever reason. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm looking down like I'm seeing. They mean nothing by now when I'm giving that talk. I'm just, I'm, I've gone into free flow, but I think it's why it worked because I let myself be neurodiverse. And that's really new. Is super scary and is not space necessarily. I'm finding my workplace is an interesting one because I'm suddenly quite different. That's another thing about late life diagnosis. You may, there's things that happen. Everyone warns you that you're going to go through uh, grief. Personally, I thought that's some kind of self-indulgent. Grief for what could have been, what should have been. I mean, you know, we all wanted to win Lotto last week. Um, but you will. And I remember Mary said to me, she said, oh, God, I just thought you were slow, Nigel. You, you didn't seem to have grief. But of course, you would start with three months of denial, at one of the phases of grief. Um, and so that's been pretty epic. It's, it's been quite full on. Um, and I've talked to other people with later life diagnoses, and they all seem to have grief. Because you look at all the situations that could have gone differently. You look at all the times. For example, I don't know that you pretended to be angry because you had the wrong vocal inflection and you didn't know how to say that to a room. Um, I mean, it's part of why, why did I get on TikTok? Why? I mean, there's that other thing, people with ADHD can't stop talking about it. It's actually studied. We love talking about it. We just can't stop ourselves. It's the neurodiversity that loves to talk about itself. It's literally in research that it's one of the signs we like to talk about it. But I wanted to hopefully offer something to people living their life backwards and suddenly realizing and kind of going, oh, it's that thing you just it's also finding your own community of people that actually go yeah this is a reality for me I've wondered all my life I literally always thought I was different to everyone else I just thought everyone thought that I literally thought everyone felt like that I, I didn't know they didn't I didn't know that other people didn't have constant racing thoughts and multiple streams of them I didn't know what people meant when they'd say I'd ask them a question that seemed important I don't know about work or money or life or something you know that they had to give an answer for and they'd say I'll oh, think about it and I'd be like in my head going how can you stop thinking about it till you've answered it like what does that mean you'll think about it and then a week later I'd say to them so that thing I asked you don't you about, obsess what? about it <laughs> I'll obsess <Yeah>. about it <laughs> until I've resolved it and answered it like it just wouldn't go away it would be instant and so a week later you know you'd say to them well, what did you decide about that question and they go, oh, I haven't thought about it. And I wouldn't know what, I, I'm not kidding. And in the last few years, I'd look at them going, what are they talking about? What do they mean they haven't thought about it? What, where do they go in their brain? What, is it empty in there? Does it just go silent? Are they like natural meditators? Like, you know, the rest of the world can't meditate, but they just go to zone nothing. I have no idea. I do notice it's quieter with the meds. I'm on Ritalin um, and it is quieter, but it's not quieter in there. It's quietened down enough. Personally, for me, they're helpful, but I don't know if I'd want a lifetime of them. Um, and they're up and down in the first eight months or so, as a warning, Todd. It's uh, not all roses. And you'll well, have I'm seeing my doctor tomorrow for a uh, possible uh, prescription, so that's good oh, to know. Good luck with that. I, I hope you've got a good doctor because that's the other thing people don't talk about. Like lawyers, like all professionals, accountants, everything, they're not all created equal. Some got C's and just got degrees. Some are brilliant. Some don't believe in neurodiversity. That's getting better. But, you know, my GP is so good that he actually looked up the psychiatrist I was going to in front of me and checked him out as appropriate to go to as an adult late life diagnosis person. He literally spent more time in that consultation checking out the proposed psychiatrist than anything else. 
they, and you know, I'm really lucky. I've got a really good GP. I had a GP who'd left notes saying she suspected ADHD from three years ago before the surge during lockdowns and COVID and stuff of people discovering it. And you know what I think? I think so many of us discovered our neurodivergence because we were forced against ourselves in ways we hadn't been. And we didn't have the distractions that we may have valued more than we understood. And that may have been micro engagements of shopping and things, or it might have been actual connection with real people or all sorts of things went south or went online. And so suddenly the other thing is there's literally an explosion on TikTok and on social media and podcasts and so on of people realizing and talking about our brains. And, you know, someone like Connor the Wolf on TikTok, who's gone from 3 million followers to about 5.5 million in a year, and I think from zero to about 5.5 million in two years or so, just shows how many people are out there trying to work out their brains, how many loved ones. You know what's interesting for me? Every family everywhere seems to have a neurodivergent or someone with some kind of um, mental health challenge or lived mental health reality, and it's not it's not uncommon at all. It's just that we're now starting to talk about it. And I'm really grateful to the younger generations who first brought this to TikTok and opened it up because, you know, I literally self-diagnosed from a single TikTok of Connor DeWolf's. I watched, I was sent a TikTok of his. I didn't, I wasn't even on TikTok. A friend sent me a TikTok, I think via Facebook. Dear God, I'm so old. Um, and um, I opened it, watched it, and I looked up, it was autism means. I look up at my husband and I say, I think I'm autistic. And without missing a beat, okay, without missing a single beat, he looks up and goes, oh, it's ADHD, I wonder about. Later, upon interrogation, I go, what the hell? Why did you, you never said anything? He goes, it was in that moment, that's just what came out. He goes, I, I don't know, I suddenly had a name for it. He goes, we didn't know what ADHD was. People weren't talking about it. We thought it was this other thing. I said, you know what's funny? No one ever called me hyperactive because I was obese, because I was chasing dopamine sugar. I was a fat teenager. I was most of my life I was very, you know, really quite obese. Um, I was certainly a good 30, 40% above recommended size. And that's been the majority of my life as I chased sugar. Um, and I didn't understand sugar fired dopamine. Understanding that alone. Once you've got the diagnosis, you've got told you can understand that your brain doesn't make as much dopamine and you pursue dopamine. And dopamine can come in good ways and bad ways, and there's positive and negative dopamine and self-degradating dopamine and so on. But just knowing that dopamine as a driver really helps. You know, I do things now to make my day go better. I, uh, two years ago, part of my quieting my brain enough to work out that I really was different to everyone else and I really did need some help, um, was losing weight and getting an exercise regime. So for me... I do a lot of jump rope skipping and literally the spinning of the rope each morning. And I do it like six days a week. Um, it's quite stimming. I call it skipping rope stimming, but just literally the good music I like. So music fires dopamine, the exercise fires dopamine. Then I eat a really high protein bar. I don't even know if I like them, but I do know that I feel heaps better. And this is one of the other things I noticed. Once I understood the connection pro about protein to creating dopamine, I look back and all my favorite foods have been quite high. Whenever I felt better after eating egg sandwiches throughout my life, love an egg sandwich. Um, sorry, vegans. Um, but, uh, you know, essentially, I'd always feel better after an egg sandwich. I'd always feel better after I'm vegetarian. So it would generally be things like tofu. And it's when it, my natural go to's have been protein. But literally across my entire life, egg sandwich is one of my favorite things with lots of filling, lots of egg. And that's because after we eat protein, it creates dopamine in our brains and we do feel better. And so I started eating these protein bars the recently. Fuck, man? You are like blowing my mind about, you're basically talking about my life right now. <laughs> it might I had be no idea. sandwich for you or something like There's probably a favorite like nuts. Food. I love nuts. Yeah. I love so eating you go, nuts. Every time you eat nuts, you feel better. Most of us will actually already eat nuts naturally. Peanut butter is a big one. But, you know, it's better on a spoon than on bread because your ratios of protein to carbs you've got to watch. Because the more protein you eat, the more you fire dopamine. And the other thing we don't get told about is gut health. 85% of our dopamine and a lot of our serotonin and lots of ADHD people have issues with both, the creation of both, um, is created in the gut. So you've actually got to eat fermented foods, which I think generally are pretty revolting, if I'm honest. I don't like that fermented flavor, but I like the effect. So I find coconut yogurt as my go-to because I actually like it. Uh, but lots of people have kimchi and, um, you know, very soy products that are fermented and things. You do want to eat something that's good for your gut health. I mean, I take a 
a probiotic and a pill because that's also something I can seem to manage more easily. Um, but gut health literally makes you happier. And when you're having a tough day, when things are all going wrong and it's not going well and it feels like the meds aren't working and coffee doesn't do anything today and nothing's really working, you will have a better day if you keep seeking dopamine hits positively. Uh, sunshine, walking. It don't, you don't have to go to the damn gym. Go for a walk in the sun. Uh, if you've got a dog, take your dog for a walk in nature if you can. These, are, you know, it doesn't have to be this. I mean, I'm a bit OCD. I literally have a... <laughs> So, you know, a year ago, I discovered I'm ADHD. And recently, I'm talking to Amy, who's a mental health nurse, who also has her own lived experience and immense lived experience and mental health issues and is probably neurodiverse. Hope you don't mind me saying that, Amy. Um, but um, she says to me recently, she goes, so what about your OCD, Nigel? And I go, what? She goes, well, you know, you know I'm a mental health nurse now. And I just wanted to mention these medication and, and people seem to find it really helpful. And I go, sorry, can we wind back to the uh, you've got OCD kind of implication? And I just look at her and I go, oh, Amy, I'm up to five neurodiversities in the last year. I literally don't have space for a six. I'll get back to you. Um, but, you know, I do think, I think that's the other thing. You've got to celebrate the weird combination. Most, so many neurodiverse people will have comorbidities, which is a very stink phrase for co-conditions. Um, and, you know, ADHD and degrees of autism, ADHD and misophonia, you know, noise sensitivity, heightened sensitivities generally. Um, I was saying to my husband, you know, um, that it reckons, one study reckons about 70% of neurodivergent people are rainbow in some way. I mean, you've got to notice dyed hair and rainbow, God, there's a lot of it. <laughs> um, <laughs> as soon as I see someone with a bit of a home dyed hair job, sorry, it does sound facetious, but you do. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, I wonder. And I mean, I have noticed a lot of neurodivergence um, on TikTok. We love cats. The cat clothing, the amount of cat clothing I see, because I have cat clothing envy from a couple of other creators where I want their tops and things like we just seem to have a... But I also think autism and animal love often live together. Um, but what you will find, most people often have more. You know, I have a thing called um, Erlen syndrome, which is yet another one, and that means I have to have these coloured lenses. It's a different colour. But about 15% of people have it, but about 30% of people with ADHD have it. And I'm not being funny. Erlen syndrome was what was first discovered that kind of opened up ADHD. It was very similar timing, but it was literally, I, oh, one of the tutors that I deal with in my day job is an expert in dyslexia. And I said to him, why do I have so many typos that I don't even notice in emails I send? I send emails full of typos and I don't even notice them until later. And I said, well, I got dyslexia. And he asked a few questions. I'm a lovely man, stops everything he's doing, about to present, just stops, gives me his full focus. And he says, I think you need to investigate Erlen syndrome. So I investigate there. And I say to him at the time, I say, oh, look, I also think I'm neurodivergent. Mike. He goes, if you've got Erlen syndrome, you kind of are, Nigel. It's under that umbrella. And I go, oh, no, I think it's a bit wider. I think I have ADHD and I might be autistic. And he's, a, he's literally a man who is very much working for the betterment of neurodivergent people, and particularly dyslexia and education of greater society. He immediately says to me, those are very big labels to wear, Nigel. You've got to decide if you want to wear them. And I look at him and I go, oh, my. I doubt I can shut up knowing me anyway. But I also think it's leadership, isn't it? Like, we've got to stand up and say, there's more of us than you know. We're everywhere. We've had success sometimes. Other times you haven't helped us enough. Um, but we are here and we are neurodivergent. And um, for me, it was an act of trying to create a bit of a model for people that like this. It's not just young people on TikTok who are neurodivergent. They might be the ones who are educating us and you might self-diagnose via TikTok first. And that is perfectly valid too, by the way. Whenever people say self-diagnosis is not valid, well, then why would you go to an expert to get formal diagnosis if you hadn't self-diagnosed? Like, how the hell would that even work? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, I don't even, you know, when people go, self-diagnosis is not valid. I'm not formally diagnosed as autistic, but okay, I'm talking to my husband the other day about this going, oh, look, I think it's pretty obvious I've got degrees of autism. I said, you know, I have, I have the sensitivity to noise. I'm misophonic. I really can't stand people's eating noises. It's, it's very challenging. Oh. Fuck. I also am sensitive to fabrics, I, but I just thought I liked merino fabric and I liked silk and I just I just thought as a bourgeois, you know, happened to like nice fabrics. It's true. Uh, but, you know, I, there's all sorts of sensitivities to things. And when I'm stressed, they're heightened. So recently I've been very stressed 
And the sound of touch typing on keyboards has been driving me crazy, which is really challenging in a small office. It's one of those things, though, it's a sign when, you know, any noises always do me in. But something new in the misophonic area tells you that you've got stress. When you your normal sensitivities rise, that actually is a warning sign of other stresses generally, that you're closer to being overwhelmed than you realise. I think that's a lot of the thing is learning how to realise the warning signs, because they come in lots of different ways. I don't know if you've got this, Todd, but lots of ADHD people are really bad at math in a way. Math is a real issue. So what I've discovered is when it goes, when your math goes, that's a warning sign. Do you have When that? it goes, math? Yeah, so like... Um, you can be good at it and then it goes away? I literally did a deal in a consignment clothing store. One of my hyper-focuses is men's fashion and I sell second-hand men's wearing things. And so I was in there and I, I'm regular, you know, for years doing this with them, a couple of years, and I'm buying a pile of stuff and they give me a discount. And I go home and I think it's wrong later. I don't know why. I get it in my head that they've got it wrong. So then I add it up 12 times on a calculator and I get this result. So I email. Oh, yes, I email and send the damn email. <laughs> then I add it up a final time after I've sent the email, undo's gone. And I get a completely different total. Even though 12 times I've got the same total, now it's a different total. Like, what? My math has gone. It's just gone. I can't see it. I can't work it out. I'm getting really confused. And I get this half line email back from the lady who's very sassy. He goes, I gave you a $14 discount on the belt. The belt actually cost her. And I'm like, I didn't feel like such a dick because I really like this person and I know she's sassy and I know she's intelligent and I <laughs> couldn't believe I've questioned her because I go, it's out of the two of you right now, knowing that you're a bit fragile, Nigel, who's getting it wrong? But no, no, you send the email. So I actually go back because they are the way they recently had an exhibition from an OCD artist's place that they sell clothes and do art. And so I literally send her an email back going, look, um, I'm really sorry. I think I'm on the verge of a neurodivergent meltdown. And um, it's really quite bad at the moment, Charlotte. And so she just comes back and goes, see you in a couple of weeks then. Um, <laughs> and that's pretty much what happened. I um, then still felt stink about having done that. But your math goes in the, I think it's called the Utah Wender test, which is one of the tests some psychiatrists use to assess whether you've got ADHD, one of the things they use, and you've got to answer it from your childhood, which is ridiculous when you're 50. I'm trying to remember your childhood. Was I an anxious child? It's literally going, was I an anxious child? And I'm going, no, no. But of course, part of my condition is delusionality. But then I suddenly realise at 50, I'm going, I don't think most kids thought about death as much as you. You probably were quite anxious. Uh, okay, here's one. And in the Uta Wender test, there's 60 questions, but only 25 actually relate to ADHD. So they're flicking out the tryhards or the people who want meds for whatever reason and so on. Um, the funny thing is once you've been on meds for a year, they're not like they level out. It's not like, you know, anyone who gets a little rise off the stimulant medication at the beginning, that will flatten very quickly. Uh, and they will just become normal and you'll just be, well, in my case, useless, waffly, drifty chaos without them. The only time I stop taking them is if I'm like full of a flu or something. And I just don't really want to know what's going on anyway. When I had COVID, I stopped taking them because I just was a bit rubbish for a few days and I just let the days and they drift. Um, but, you know, you don't, this idea that people kind of fake it. But anyway, so 25 questions. And of those 25 questions, the person must get a four of three of them. Now, one of the three is you were bad at school. And so I'm freaking out because I was really good at school. Well, kind of, I find as I'm answering the test, because it's like then another one of the three. And I don't know these three. You must get one of them as a four out of four. I only find this out days later. Um it says, are you bad at math? So I cast myself back to secondary school and I go, maybe I was bad. I always got A's. But you cheated, Nigel. You copied Lindsay Brazendale, the guy who sat next to you, who half the class copied. You copied his assignments. <laughs> Lindsay Brazendale was very good at math. You weren't. And then I think to myself, yeah. And then you were the bell ringer. Like in my school, we had a bell between periods and I was the bell ringer, swatty little thing. Um, and so um, I was good at school wasn't necessarily so popular as a weird kid, you know, I was the weird kid, the weird gay kid at that. Not that I was out as gay. It's just that people pick it. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, different era, but um, I suddenly realized an English teacher had said to me that I liked at the time, Nigel, you've got to stop shortening the math period just because you don't like it. So as bell ringer, unofficially, <laughs> I had started shortening the math period because I hated it so much. And then of course, as soon as I was legally allowed to stop math, I stopped. 
So after 15, I didn't do any secondary school math. So then I go, I'm doing the test and I go, actually four. I was bad at math. I was good at cheating. I didn't care how I got the result. Very ADHD brain. The result matters. I don't care how I get there. The process isn't very important. Don't talk to me about process. Da, da, da. You know, the process <laughs> people in life kind of kill me. Um, and so I'm cheating. And so I give myself a four. And then the other one, I can't remember, but I give myself a four. So then when I'm talking to my psychiatrist for the first time for the assessment, and I don't understand he's looking at things like referential thinking more than what I'm saying. Um, I say to him, oh, that freaked me out, that test. I had 20 minutes to do it because the nurse said she was trying to fit me in between a gap and, you know, I had to get it done. And so I did it. And I said, but then like a week later, I found out how it worked. And I was just really stressed out because I didn't think that I'd shown you what I wanted to show you. He go, And he goes, you know, so I just go, so you were stressed that you, once you worked out how the test worked, you could have got a higher grade in your ADHD assessment. And I go, <laughs> yeah, that's not great, eh? I just I sound like a total cheat right now because, well, I suppose... I suppose I was trying to again, you know, like they said, and he looked at me and goes, the test doesn't matter. The test doesn't matter. He goes, but wow, we haven't seen a number like yours in ages. Um, he said it was really high. Um, and I just went, oh, he goes, so you didn't need to worry. You, you did give a lot of, I said, it was just very hard trying to relate to what you did as a child. But what I didn't realize is of the two where you had to get four out of, like one of them had to be four out of four. I had two of them at four. Um, and it was only once I reasoned through things. And so that can be quite difficult, uh, depending on what you know, initial assessment, who you're dealing with. I did find it really challenging casting back to have an accurate view of who I was as a child. I've only just learned, truly recently, I've only just learned that other children did not live a James Bond fantasy reality, poor them, um, with a soundtrack. You know, my entire life was, I was a spy. Events, commonplace events were linked to my spy fantasy in my head, which made life so much more interesting. So, you know, something like going into the supermarket with mum might have actually been a whole kind of espionage adventure in my brain. I thought we were all doing that. I honestly didn't know. And for me, James Bond was big. Like, he was really iconic in my little small town New Zealand. And they had the movies in the local cinema. And, you know, my brother and I used to go every summer and see them. So I really did live this kind of spy fantasy thing. Have um, you ever heard of maladaptive daydreaming? Yeah, only recently. Uh, uh, so apparently, um, I, I was saying in that talk, but I mean, a lot of us are a bit delusional because you, well, it's like now. Apparently, I'm much more patient with situations that I would previously have been really short fused with. But it's only others reflecting to me. A colleague said to me, wow, you really dealt with that annoying phone call with much more grace than you would have before you were diagnosed and medicated. And I said, what was I like before? She goes, oh, you just you just lose it at some point and shut them down and want it done. Like you just get bored. And I said, you know, the funny thing is it's because we can already hear what you're going to say and we already know. And if we're not interested, we don't want to hear it all. Like it literally hurts to hear it. It's a burden and you're wasting my time. And you know, the funny thing is I've always felt like people are wasting my time with their waffle, even though I talk endlessly a waffle. Um, I haven't even uh, asked a question yet. What's that? We're half an hour in. I haven't even asked a question yet. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I, I won't interrupt anymore. <laughs> no, I didn't even know if we'd started it. Just we sort of chatted. <laughs> yeah, I haven't even hit record yet. <laughs> no, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, it, it's, it is, I suppose that's, in a way, the intensity of all this is what it's like at midlife or later life finding out. You literally suddenly see yourself differently. You can feel like you're going through teenage again because I've even uh, I've had to ask everything from like, am I actually gay or did I decide that involved in some masking back in my teens? Um, you ask everything about it. I watched a lady on TikTok, Ella, and she says the same. She's non-binary with kids. And she says, you know, you go through teenage things. I discovered that, um, you know, I loved fashion. And yet when I was obese throughout my life, I had stopped caring about clothes. And now I love fashion again, and I know, you know, a lot about men's fashion. It's one of my hyper-focuses. Um, I was already growing carnivorous plants, but I suppose my enjoyment of that's grown up. Um, I'm cheekier again, but in a nice way. I feel like I've got more levity and like, you know, when I, was, I describe myself as a smart mouth or I feel like I'm, it's more good humoured. I'm less defensive. I've been defending a corner for so long. That's probably the bit that really upsets you. 
you just start to go, what's my personality? What's my neurology? What's my mask? I think that late life diagnosed people need to own that masking has helped us. Masking is not all bad. Everyone masks to certain extents. Masking can be damaging. I do get that. I'm pro- I reckon I've probably got post-traumatic stress disorder from the amount of masking I've done or chronic, the CPSD or whatever. I've, I've variously, I mean, I've you know only got 22,000 followers. I've only been on TikTok for, I don't know, a couple of months. But um, I've Pastor. already been told it. So oh. have I, and I got like 300. I don't know what I think. <laughs> I mean, honestly, they were cut from that talk to be direct and smart. And I'm playing a lot of techniques, but I was trying to hopefully connect with people. But it does, you do find that um, lots of, I mean, there's so many creators talking about AHD, you kind of go, I'm swamped anyway, should I be? I admire a lot of creators. I've spoken live to a couple of creators. Um, for me, they were quite distinct from each other. Um, I suppose what I didn't see is, I know lots of old, young younger people were on TikTok, but not as many older people. And I don't know. It's like therapy. It's like when you've been told all your life that you're too intense, you're too loud, you talk too much. Um, those ideas that just you're too much. And, you know, I wrote to my doctor when he asked me to write it up. I said, when they're being kind, they say you're passionate. When they're being kind of in the middle, they say, oh, you're too much. And when they're being mean, they say something quite a lot else. Um, but most many of us with the hyperactive low impulse control type of ADHD and is that too how many kinds of ADHD are there I don't know some people say seven some say three um you know we and people move between different presentations I think many of us are more lean towards one side um you've often heard that a lot you're too much you're too intense you talk too much so talking to a world where they're choosing to follow you and listen to you is deeply flattering but I would also say that people very quickly, I had to look stuff up. Someone told me I had APSD from one tiny TikTok, which actually is the polite way of saying you're a psychopath. Um, <laughs> someone else told you me I was a total narcissist, you know? it's um, Yeah, I, I got, someone said, uh, this sounds more like borderline personality disorder, what you're describing. I was like, but you don't, I made one little video and you, you, you're already diagnosing me. <laughs> so I suppose I'm going to do, I was going to do some back to what I call the trolls, replying to the trolls, but I'm quite fierce back at people because I'm actually trying to have a healthy conversation. So I say to them, I go, thanks, doctor. Um, you know, <laughs> from one, as I said to one lady, she goes, oh, my daughter's got HD and it's nothing like this. And I'm like, yeah, it's probably a different presentation. It's a stupid name for a condition that has multiple presentations that are literally the opposite of each other. I mean, I don't know if you've seen Connor DeWolf. He calls it um, Dave. And um, in Te Reo Māori here in New Zealand, the Indigenous people of New Zealand have a word for ADHD, which is Aorere Tini. And it's a much better name because what it means is many ideas in your head at once. Doesn't that sum it up better, I think? And I mean, even if you're the drifty, disconnected kind, I think most ADHDs, that's a commonality. Many ideas. It might be drifty ideas or it might be quite hyper-focused. The reality is actually what's in our head. One uh, person stitched with me and I thought that was an interesting comment. You know, I was talking about pushing fantasy into reality and he was basically saying pushing reality into fantasy, you know, and in a way those ideas appeal because, I mean, I know it's intellectual, but we do live in our heads anyway. And lots of us with neurodiversities will spend, we, we analyse things so much more deeply. We think about things, the racing thoughts, the layers I seriously think for a neurodivergent person, we probably think about three neurotypical lifetimes of thoughts or something. You know, they say <laughs> things like by the time we're, I think it's 15 or something, we will have had 40,000 more potential rejections because of being neurodiverse by our peers and kids that will have layered in trauma that we can never <laughs> probably unpack, truly. I don't know, maybe we can, but um, it's, it's that thing, you know, and we're going to have done things that, we probably didn't love. You know, if you're an ADHD rage, I've been a rage in a situation where I've been begging myself internally to stop. Like, Nigel, just stop. Please stop. And I, I couldn't. I don't know why. And that's part of knowing is good. You know, the compulsive shopping, the fashion thing. I mean, one of the first signs that made me wonder is I, for the, two years ago in 2020, after the first lockdown in New Zealand, I started buying these fashion items, you know, more money than I spent on clothing, kind of three, four hundred dollars an item, which I know for some people is not a lot, but for me that seemed a lot for an item of clothing. Um, and I started hiding it from my husband. I've never done that, never done it. And I couldn't stop myself. And I'm like, what's going on? And so for me, I don't know what happened for you, Todd, but 
a pile of stuff was going wrong, let's be honest. Uh, 30s were messy, 40s were terrible. Um, I was really unhappy. I didn't talk about being unhappy. Uh, I fake smile in every photo. And I kind of, oh, you know, the RSD is constant about things. You're always traumatised about something. You're always stressed about something. If something goes wrong, you can't let it go. Um, and small incidents, you know, and even things like road rage. I saw myself one time, within five minutes, I'm like letting someone in and being generous. And then later I'm screaming and waving my fists, like within a couple of minutes at another driver. And I'm thinking, wow, that's quite polar. At that point I'm going, are you bipolar? You've literally just gone from kind of <laughs> I've been, after you. I've been asked that. Yeah, yeah. I've been asked that. Because I'll, I'll, I'll do the opposite too. I'll be like, oh, what the fuck? I started, I started, I started. So what are you guys doing this weekend? And then yeah. they're like, what <laughs> the fuck was that? <laughs> that is so difficult. I, I can literally be, because you can be in several conversations. I don't know if this happens to you, but lots of us find social situations both overwhelming and interesting, like restaurants and things, because if you're bored in the conversation you're in, <laughs> you're tuning into other ones around. It's only, and you know, you, it depends on how many different people will manage different numbers. I particularly hate it when there's just like four people and I'm with the person I don't want to talk to and I'm interested <laughs> in what the other two are doing because I will be paying more attention to theirs while pretending to be a mine. Um, the other thing is you don't, oh, I had a one recently that's really interesting is that at funerals, neurotypical people unmask. They don't know they do. So I was at a funeral recently and the husband of a friend who I don't like, really, I thought nakedly showed me he didn't like me either. And I thought, wow, this is kind of fresh, actually. I really appreciate this. Maybe now we can just get along on the fact we've got nothing in common and you're a dick. Um, <laughs> and you think I am, and that's okay. Um, but now I've seen him again recently, and the mask was back on because he didn't realise. I thought that we had, in my head, I thought there was some kind of new agreement that would just be honest. But what I didn't realise is funerals are masked neurotypicals. So if you ever actually want to read someone, it's a good place to go because their they're more naked feelings will come out, I believe. I've got to test this more, but it's a new theory I'm running <laughs> about. Funerals are a good place to find out what neurotypicals actually think of you. If you, 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 get, you need more yeah. dead people in your life to to do that research. I hate funerals. I hate death. I'm really bad about <laughs> oh, it. Neurodivergence and death, we often don't like it. Isn't it? Death is just so inconvenient and it's annoying at times and it's oh. you're full of guilt too. And it's just like, I don't know. If I don't have time to all have all these feelings and now this person's dead and... It sounds terrible and it sounds selfish, but sometimes, you know, I get those moments like that where it's like, oh, fuck, now they're dead. Now I got to deal with this. <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> I, uh, like... Honestly, that's all, how I always feel. I'd feel that if, if someone I deeply loved to happen. I know it sounds awful, but it's the, I'm, I hate inconvenience. That's actually quite a symptom of autism often. Um, I absolutely hate being inconvenienced I didn't understand the deep level of that so death is always inconvenient um <laughs> and well that's convenient yeah yeah no and it's it's the um I think we struggle to emotionally and my guess is because for me I can't always be like immediately upset at that point that's not how grief will work for me so I'm not like the dead and I'm gonna cry and go to the funeral and do it all like that I can seem really stoic and disconnected and like um, I don't care and I can be glib and laugh at the wrong time and all that stuff um, because neurotypical people seem to immediately go into grief and stuff and, and I don't think it works like that for neurodivergence. I mean uh, something that happened recently is my husband was away for two weeks in New York and I missed him. Now this sounds, uh, for neurotypical people they go on the moment their partner's away they, it's like they, I don't know, that they were Siamese twins and they've just been severed it seemed pathetic to me, it's like for goodness sake, absence makes the heart grow fonder and it'd be nice to have some space but this time, for the first time ever when he went away, um, and it's been a while since he you know, went away without me um, that I actually missed him and I wondered if that was the meds because normally I would have just been like oh, <laughs> space um and so I do think that we do process emotions quite differently because you know for me I I wouldn't think um I I just always surprised by how quick neurotypicals seem to go to an emotional reaction and I think we can both be really fast you know fiery rage in a second or quite contained and it sits in a box and grief is one of those. I think often we, I don't know if I can resolve grief. It's really weird. I don't know if anyone does. I think time thins the pain. I don't think it um, ever goes away if you truly love someone. And, and you know, everyone says that neurotypical or not, or 
New York Davos, but I don't. You're starting to make me think. Out. Maybe, sorry, I, I'm starting to think. Maybe you're starting to plant the seed that maybe I'm autistic. Even <laughs> often, <laughs> some of the stuff you're together. saying. Oh, often they go together, but the symptom overlaps are really deep, and it's the neurology behind it that would determine it. So you can have lots of these same things under ADHD. That is the difference. I don't know that I have autism, but um, given that when I said to people who know me, the same people who said, you know, like my husband and my good friend Mary and stuff, you know, I said to Mary, I think I'm um, autistic. And she just went, well, definitely some kind of neurodivergent. And now we laugh now that we're up to five. We go, well, you probably got it right, really. That's about the best description. Um, you know, and I said, and we're ignoring Amy's OCD comments with that five. Um, I got, I found out I got aphantasia, which means I don't visualize. So I don't, when I draw, I'm really bad drawer because I don't visualize. So um, I've got, I don't know this person has it, but I bought this recently at an art exhibition. So as soon as I saw it, I went, I think that person has aphantasia. It was a, you know, student art exhibition, but it's very similar to how I draw cats still. Mine's worse. Mine's frozen at age four. Um, but I don't visualize. So if you say apple, I don't see an apple. I might see the word. I, I have the memory of an apple, but apparently lots of people see an apple. This is why my art skills are appalling because I cannot hold the vision of what I'm drawing, you know, like, and, and draw it. So I discovered recently I got a Fantasia. Uh, I definitely have Erlen syndrome and the glasses help enormously. Um, what is that again? That's a visual processing disorder. So it's not dyslexia. It's where words move on pages and you literally have to fight to hold words in place as you read. And it's, it means that reading is exhausting. So, but people with ADHD have trouble reading too. But then often 30% of people with ADHD have Erlen's versus the main pop stream population total was 15%. So it's quite common and not, the problem is lots of optometrists and ophthalmologists don't believe in it. But the optometrist that did me uh, did it for me. He said, "Well, I just found it was working for people, so I stopped caring what people said worked. I, I cared what all the clients who were saying it helps." I literally can't see through my prior prescription glasses that are now not Erlen's tinted. Like I can't read through them; they're so useless now. Now that the and this, what happens in brain scans is your brain lights up when you read if you are Erlen's without it. It's exhausting. So just Erlen's alone is enough to have you arrive home at the end of each day naked. That's another late life symptom. You, by the end of your day of work or whatever, you arrive home and you've got nothing left. You're exhausted. There's nothing left. You've got very little time for any interests. You start losing your hyper interest because you're just wiped out from masking and trying to get through the world. I actually work a part-time job and it's financially hard and my wife is extremely pa patient with me and stuff. And it's because I, I like... I, I so one of my things is I've I quit jobs every like year every two years I yeah. bounce from job to job to job to job, and uh, so now I finally decided maybe I just can't have a full time job so I've been working part time, in so that I can do stuff like the podcast and other things my other hyper focus right. that I like, um and it is it's like well I've had so many people like well why don't you just do it on the evenings and weekends it's like because I fucking can't. I come home and I'm like comatose for like oh. three hours straight. So basically since launching the TikTok, it's gone really badly from my perspective because I've had massive um, grief and I had a huge, probably in a way, one of the bigger, it's a bit like bursting a pimple or something recently. I've had a huge neurodivergent meltdown really at my workplace and things. That late life diagnosis, it's like a come to and I found myself in the job and I'm going, I don't know if I'd choose this. If, you know, I literally find myself dealing with a lot of people, which seems odd really, because I'm not sure I like people. I quite <laughs> like to work with animals, I think. Um, you know, it's so it's kind of, you do, you come to and you, you might question everything, your hobbies, your interests, you quite often have what seem quite childish interests. I mean, you know, I say I'm into fashion. I dress, well, I said to someone recently, I dress like a slutty teenager when I can. Um, mm. <laughs> I, I don't, you know, my sense of fashion style is loud over the top. It's kind of not at all discreet. It's, uh, and a lot of neurodivergent people do seem to be kind of out there in the way they dress, the things we like, quite childish quite often. Um, but it's about a levity and, I don't know. I think be what you are. You know, I said this, you, I really think that we just need to let people crack their atom and let their light flow. It doesn't matter what 
And see, even that, that's a stolen line from a rap song. We're really bad at that. Our best ideas are sto- stolen from songs and movies. You know, <laughs> in everything I do, there's stolen ideas. So I suppose that's that cheater energy again. Where, you know, there's a, a book uh, called Steal Like an Artist, New York Times bestseller book, that I loved because it says basically, it doesn't matter where you got it from, it's what you do with it. Nothing's original anyway. It's where you take it. And we do. Uh, it's really common with ADHD that we actually, our best ideas come from sources of inspiration, I'll call it, but movies and songs and things. I often say things when I'm talking public talks and things that are literally song lines. I just can't help myself. I've quoted Madonna more than <laughs> once, and I don't know why I'd do that. Um, <laughs> you know, you just it's, it's, we can't stop ourselves sometimes. And it's not that it's naughty, but it's someone said to me, you know, you've got to tell people whether you're being neurological or naughty. And I said, but for me, they're fused. I do quite enjoy yeah. winding people up sometimes. And, and watching them rise can fire dopamine for me. It's not that I'm being mean, but is it neurological or naughty? Well, I'm kind of naughty by nature if I'm happy. I'm cheeky. I'm actually quite stroppy, uh, which I don't know if it's such a common word in your part of the world because I had a video about stroppy. But it means, you know, um, naughty, cheeky, you know, you're misbehaving and you're – it's not that I'm – I like to play practical jokes on people, but I do like a kind of levity and savviness in people, you know, and I like people who fire back or actually call me on my stuff, but actually create a relationship where we can be honest with each other rather than all the fakeness, neurodivergence. We hate it. We hate small talk. We hate fakeness. We can read your lies. We gag on the disdain that you have if you're not, you know, we'd actually, I don't know. I think that someone tell me they think I'm a dick and they don't like me then they pretend to like me and I've got to play with that. I know that's not popular with people, but honestly, um, yeah, I do like direct, clear communication. Actually, in my assessment, because not only, because the psychologist was taking notes of not just the answers I was making, but like the whole process, the whole process, like everything I was saying and doing in between the questions, she was making notes and I didn't realize and uh, I guess at one point I warned her that I like inappropriate jokes. And then she, <laughs> in the assessment, I can't remember what it, what it says word for word, but it's it's like at one point Todd took picked up the item and made an inappropriate joke. But he he did pre warn me that this is something that happens often in his life. You know, it's like so I I totally get that. We're often told we're inappropriate. We're often yeah, told. I totally get that mesh of my humor is also my. My, is part of my neurodivergence. That's just they come hand in hand for me. It's it's not no, one too. or the other. And I have quite a dark sense of humor at this age and late stage. You know, I do joke a lot about things that people don't find funny. Serial killers. Um, I have a fascination <laughs> I, with them. I and it does give me a little dopamine hit when other people are like, oh, taken back by it. It's like, ha ha. I know. Gotcha. I, I like, I've always enjoyed saying things that provoke. I've also always, I, I've told the truth to power all my life. It's got me, I'm not sure where, but I struggle with inequity and injustice really badly, which is quite a neurodivergent thing. We can feel very, very against uh, injustice. And so I, I struggle and I rage against it and it doesn't work for me. I don't know, but it doesn't work for me not to. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I, the studies have shown that groups of neurodivergents talking to groups of neurodivergents get on well. Groups of neurotypicals talking to groups of neurotypicals get on well. Groups of neurodivergents and neurotypicals trying to talk to each other create Chinese whispers disasters. Um, and so that's interesting, though, in terms of where you should look to find your comfort because, you, you know, there are great neurotypical people who are even better because they kind of get us and so on. But often find, you know, if you want genuine company, then you'll find it in another neurodivergent in a different way, you know, but there are people who overlap well, um, often because they've got a neurodivergent partner, though. Thank you so much, Nigel. I very much appreciate that. And all of that was very, very relatable to me. Uh, and I'm guessing to a lot of people. And, and that's a, that's the thing, folks. Um, if you know people that this podcast could help or people could relate or, you know, uh, not feel alone with, please tell people about the podcast. Uh, word of mouth is, is very big. Yeah. Please tell people about the podcast. Uh, you never know who, who might get some kind of help or insight from it. So please do that. And because I'm sick, I'll just quickly say, follow me on Instagram and Twitter. 
uh, Bunny Hugs Podcast. And uh, you can always leave comments and concerns and questions on there. And please rate and review the podcast on Apple. That really, really does help uh, beyond charts and things like that. And, you know, the, the higher you go up on the charts, you know, the more guests you can get. And then the more people we can help to to listen and relate and and not feel alone with their illnesses and mental health issues so please do that okay i'm out of here i gotta go blow my nose uh please remember to make your beds and take your meds bye <laughs>